Mental health is a hot topic these days, especially so among organizations as they begin incorporating psychological health and safety components into their existing safety management systems. I know this can feel a little overwhelming, so I want to break it down into small, manageable pieces to get you started. I would also like to share insights from some industry experts. Let the journey begin. The CSA Group outlines best practices for organizations on how to best support their employees' mental health and wellness. The CSA standard is voluntary, which means you get to decide exactly what to include in your psychological health and safety program. Legislation is moving in this direction, so you might as well get started and get ahead of the game. Before you decide what to include in your program, you should consider the many benefits of implementation. We are going to demonstrate that it is not as costly or as difficult as you might think. Step 1. Commitment. This is the most critical piece and needs to extend beyond senior leadership. It's best if you obtain commitment and support across all levels of your organization and allow employees to provide input early on during your program development stage. You may want to consider having people stand up as mental health champions or advocates internally to share those key messages. So why is this so important and how do you obtain true commitment? My name is Elizabeth Rankin Horvath and I'm the president and founder of Hale Health and Safety Solutions. When we look for organizational commitment, what we're looking for is the senior levels of management in the organization that they are visibly demonstrating that they are committed to this culture change because that's really what it is. It's a culture change within the organization. When I talk with those senior levels of management or when I talk with HR, for example, who have been tasked with implementing the national standard and I ask them about, well, do you have that organizational commitment? And they say, yes. And I say, okay, so what's the budget? And then they say, oh, well, we don't have much of a budget. Then I know that there really isn't organizational commitment because when a company is committed to doing something, they need to really look at it and see, well, what's the process? What is it that we're putting in place? And what resources do we need in order to succeed? Really, to gain that buy-in, we have to understand what are the fears and the concerns that people have when they're going to be starting to go forward with this. So, for example, when we talk to frontline managers, sometimes the fears that come back are that, well, I don't really know, you know what the signs and symptoms are of someone with mental illness or you know, I don't know how to handle these kinds of situations when they come up. But we also have to talk to them about, well, what does support look like for you? So when you are faced with a situation where you're having to make a decision in either dealing with somebody who may have a mental illness or you're making a decision for protection and promotion of mental health in the workplace. So maybe it's, you know, changing the way that the work is done or making a scheduling change and how is that going to impact them. We have to know that what they need for the support from their senior management to say, yeah, I have support to make this change. As far as a Pandora's box though, really what we're looking at is what are the workplace factors that are impacting people's mental health. So it's not a matter of do we need to accommodate everyone, it's what are the factors in the workplace that are impacting our workers' mental health. Whatever we put in place to make improvements is going to make improvements across the board. If we do have people that need accommodation, then there's things that we should be doing to accommodate those people. I was at kind of a half-day workshop talking about mental health in the workplace, and a lot of it revolved around the psychological standard, uh, safety standard, and what I had learned kind of about it was that it's, it's coming in as something that, you know, isn't going to be optional much longer. It's going to be something that a lot of workplaces are going to have to adopt. So when I learned about it, I kind of brought it back to my director and, and talk to him a little bit about the standard and about the 13 factors that make up the standard. Honestly, it, it didn't take much convincing to, to talk to the executive director and to talk to leadership. It was something that, as an organization, we had already been doing and we just didn't realize that there was a framework to be doing it in. 
So we were able to just look at it and start to say, well, we're kind of halfway there. And I think a lot of organizations who are initially looking at this standard and who might be a little bit worried about it, a lot of these steps are, are small steps and they're, they're incremental and it's not something that, that has to be done overnight. Safety is a standing agenda item on every leadership meeting. So it was really easy to kind of include this in that umbrella of safety and start talking about it, not just as physical safety, but psychological safety as well. Step two, baseline assessment. You need to evaluate what you already have in place, which may be more than you realize. Why redo work that is already complete? Tap into resources like Workplace Strategies for Mental Health, a great online resource with several free templates for you to use. Take a look at the one titled 20 Questions for Leaders about Workplace Health and Safety, which might highlight areas where you could be legally exposed, such as occupational health and safety, employment standards, and human rights. These key questions will get you thinking about the current state of your organization and what you want the future to look like. You can use the CSA standard itself and check off the pieces you already have in place. Keep in mind that although the CSA standard is voluntary, protecting the health and safety of your people is not. Well, the first thing that I would say is that this is a journey. This isn't gonna be done overnight. And like any journey, any culture change that you're going to undertake or any project that you really wanna undertake in an organization, in order to be successful, you really have to kind of take a good deep breath and look at where are we going with this? How long is it going to take? What resources? And understand that it's going to take time. And I think the other thing that I would say is that there's going to be a return on investment in this. We already know that you know, mental health issues are the leading cause of disability in the workplace. It's costing employers a fortune. But most employers don't really know what it's costing them in their organization. They haven't measured it. So when they start to put these improvements into place and they're measuring the impact, they'll see that they're getting a return on their investment. And as far as a roadmap for putting the whole thing together, there's a lot of resources out there that are available. But really, you know, starting with where are we at right now? Where do we want to go and what do we need to get there? That's really as simple as it comes down to. The standard lays out all the steps. Step three, devise a plan. Make sure to include objectives, targets, and communication as part of your plan. Poor communication with employees may be viewed as lack of transparency, which goes against what you're trying to achieve. A schedule is also a good idea, as it allows you to monitor progress and deadlines. In order to develop the objectives and targets, it's really important that those be developed in consultation with the people who have to fulfill them. Anyone who's in a leadership position needs to be involved in developing those targets and objectives. And certain representatives of employees as well should be involved. So it ends up being a consultative process. Once you have those targets and objectives developed with the consultation of the people who are expected to do it, you know that you've got intrinsic motivation, you know that you've got buy-in, and they know that you're serious about reaching those targets and objectives because senior management will not only have thought about the vision, but they'll have thought about what resources they need to support them. Step four, measure and revise. To evaluate the success of your plan, baseline indicators should be reviewed. What you will be looking for is change to these indicators. Compare the data you collected prior to implementation versus the data collected now. These indicators can include absenteeism rates, workplace injury stats, employee assistance plan use, turnover rate, return to work and accommodation data, and the results of employee surveys or reviews. Remember, these are just potential indicators to track and it will look different for each organization. Depending on the change in the indicators, you can clearly see whether or not your plan is having a positive impact. Since you have all of this information available to you already, why not put it to work? When we really started to 
see success or, or the best outcome for me is when employees start to champion it at their own team or at their own workplace or at their own group and they're starting to come up with their own innovative ideas in order to help their team, whether it's a, a new team building activity or a new training that they heard about from some other organization that they want to try with their team. And just that they're able to communicate that and we're able to see if it's something that we can do is really, you know, the biggest success story here at CORE. So I think the benefit of, you know, starting off with mental health first aid is that it, it just shows everyone that we're okay to talk about it and that, that we value the mental health of our employees. Initially, we offered it as a training platform for our employees to better equip them for supporting people in the community. After that, it kind of started to grow into a conversation piece and allowed people to talk more about mental health. As the years went on and we trained more and more people in it, um, we found that people were wanting more and wanting more things to do with mental health. And it sort of triggered this effect of looking for everything that we could do to support our employees with their mental health as if their mental health is as strong as we can be, we know that them supporting people in the community is going to be even better. It's so great that when you come to CORE, you know, everyone is trained in mental health first aid. And we do have so many things involved with our organization to help employees feel safe and feel supported and feel like if they're struggling with something, whether it be really small or really big, there is something that can help them. And you know, when I have had those moments, which I have, where I have had anxiety or I haven't been that happy at work and I've debated like, do I have to leave this job? Like, I'm not feeling happy right now. I'm not feeling good. What can I do? And when I've reached out and when I've said like, I need some support right now. I'm not doing okay. I love my work, but I'm not feeling happy right now. I'm not gonna be judged by that. And it's made me feel, okay, I can stay here and I can keep doing this. And you know, I'm not alone. And just because I'm feeling this way, it doesn't mean I'm a bad employee or I'm not doing my job properly. I almost felt the opposite. I felt kind of empowered knowing that, you know, I could express myself and I could say how I was feeling. And in return, I, you know, was so supported by those around me. I think as an employee that is so important and I think that's what's kept me around for three years. I think some organizations think that uh, by making, you know, mental health a priority is that other things are going to shift down on the priority, you know, list. But really, if you're, if you're putting your employees wellness first, then you're going to get, you know, more productive, more, more productive employees and, and higher efficiency. Remember, you don't have to do it all, and you definitely don't have to do it all today. The best scenario for any business is employees who are at work, healthy, and safe. Take small, steady steps towards creating the ideal scenario in your organization. The SHSA is here to support you every step of the way. Occupational health and safety is everyone's responsibility, and this includes the psychological component. Be proactive about your own health and safety, as well as those around you.